I'm a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I've been here for about 10 years as a lecturer before that kind of studying philosophy um, mm -hmm. at postgraduate level and mm -hmm. undergraduate level before that. Um, in terms of like what kind of stuff that I do, I guess my main interest um, is in the sort of philosophy of mind and cognitive science. Mm -hmm. So very broadly, I guess like what really floats my philosophical boat is understanding how um, the mind arises like in the natural world. Like what is it to have a mind? How do they work? What kinds of things do and don't have minds? Um, but I try to sort of approach those questions in quite a sort of eclectic, broad-minded way. So part of what I'm interested in is like thinking about various views within contemporary cognitive science and psychology and um, thinking about what kinds of explanations of mind and consciousness and experience and agency we might be able to glean from our best contemporary science of minds. But I'm also very interested in the, the history of philosophy um, and in particular whether certain figures primarily in the sort of recent-ish history of European mm -hmm. philosophy might have useful forgotten insights that we can use to shape our understanding of minds today. Um, thank you. And so there's, as you say that, I'm learning more too. And so there's loads we can go into. I think it could be helpful to maybe, maybe if you could sort of define what even is uh, embodied cognition and, and the embodied and activist like study of, of the mind. Sure. So the embodied cognition is a kind of catch all or like umbrella term for um, a family of approaches in cognitive science and the philosophy of mind that, as the name suggests, all share in common this emphasis on the ways in which the, the mind itself or the kinds of mind that something has might be shaped by the kind of body it has and the kinds of bodily capacities that it has. Um, so one helpful way of introducing embodied cognition as a movement perhaps is to contrast it with um, the sort of disembodied approach to mm -hmm. the mind that was uh, popular, dominant really, in um, orthodox 20th century cognitive science. Mm. Um, and so this is the view that really um, constitutes the the formation of cognitive science as its own discipline, which as it originated in the 20th century is just this project of understanding minds as basically computing devices. Mm -hmm. um, these material devices that can somehow um, produce and manipulate symbolic states that mean something according to um, particular rules. So very, very roughly the project of um, cognitive science as it arose as a discipline in the 20th century was to just use that computational uh, metaphor or model as our lens for understanding as much of the mind as we possibly could. And so one thing that started to happen towards the end of the 20th century is that um, there, there started to be various sor sources of pushback um, against that vision or discontent with it, um, one of which was uh, the movement that sort of has become known as embodied cognition which emphasizes in different ways the fact that like, well, hold on, we're not just these like abstract computing devices, we're these living, breathing organisms that have bodies that move around in the world. And so what all the different sort of families and flavors of embodied cognition have in common is the view that in some way kind of treating us as these um, abstract kind of symbol manipulation, symbol manipulation machines or information processing machines uh, distract our attention from some things about the fact that we're these living, embodied, active agents that might also be really important for understanding the sorts of minds that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get into then kind of yeah, some of the things that you you tackle like using that framework. Um, it says that you you work on and 
and you've had many papers on, for example, human perception, agency, how we understand the world, right? So in what ways does a, an embodied framework help answer some of those questions? What kind of questions do you tackle um, sort of in light of that? Well, I guess for me, the way that I got into these issues was sort of thinking about perceptual experience. Um, so, you know, when I said that mm. what sort of floats my boat are, are yeah. these questions about minds and how they work and how they get into the world, um, I think a natural entry point for starting to find those questions interesting is um, thinking about uh, the the sort of conscious aspect of perceptual experience, right? So what it feels like to watch a beautiful sunset or, um, you know, look up at a lovely clear blue sky or like feel the warmth of the sun on your skin. Mm -hmm. um, these are all kind of experiences where we're not, it's not just that we're kind of like processing, you know, like random meaningless information. It's mm -hmm. that it kind of feels like something very distinctive to um, be in those perceptual states. Um, and so that, that question of like how to explain this conscious or felt aspect of experience is is really what kind of got me got me into philosophy and kept me going um, in philosophy. Mm. And so when when you think about those sorts of conscious perceptual experiences, like feeling feeling warmth, like seeing colors, feeling pleasure, like that sort of thing. It doesn't really seem like bodies or agency um, or movement like have a lot to do with it. It's very natural to think of perception as just this like purely passive sort of like recording process mm -hmm. in the same way that, you know, a, a um, video camera just like records the kind of stream of optical information that goes into it. Perhaps that's just like all that we're doing when we perceive the world. Our brains are just these like complex devices that work a bit like um, a bit like a camera, just, you know, mm. sensory information flows in and we record them and somehow experience results. And so um, the kind of views that I'm interested in um, all try to sort of like push back against that static uh, camera like model of perception in various ways and emphasize the way in which uh, when we perceive the world, we're not just kind of like passively soaking up information. We're always actively kind of shaping and manipulating and modulating the mm. sensory information that we receive from the world. So a really simple case here would be um, just seeing like a, a simple geometrical shape, like a cube, okay, if you, um, if you're kind of confronted with a cube in front of you, then um, it's just like a fact about uh, about geometry and the, the way that the spatial world is that you, you can't see all the different faces of the cube at once. You can only ever see um, three of them at a time. The rest are obscured from you. Um, but nonetheless, we kind of don't see the cube as just this kind of like three faced mm -hmm. thing. We kind of see it as this like solid three dimensional uh, object with like six regular faces. Um, mm -hmm. How do we do that? Well, one answer to that question might be to say that like, well, our brains just have this um, fancy capacity to somehow kind of create or like build up some kind of like internal model of the six faced cube inside us and mm -hmm. we somehow um, use the impoverished sensory information that we get from those three faces of the cube that are in front of us to somehow like infer or deduce that like that's the kind of thing that we're confronted with but a more um, embodied and active way of um, thinking about how we see something like a cube is to emphasize the way in which look I can I uh, can see that this is a six faced object in front of me precisely because I've got the kind of body that can move around it I can mm -hmm. explore it I can like go go around behind it and bring the other sides into into view or I can pick it up and turn it around in my hands um, so the kind of views that I'm interested in really tries to sort of um, push that insight as far as it can go and think about ways in which the kinds of like mobile exploring bodies that we have um, shape the kinds of perceptions that are available to us.
Mm -hmm. in, in that sense, it's so it's kind of that the fact that we're the kind of agent that can manipulate things and that has the ability to do that. And so that that shapes the way we we don't just perceive like maybe simple representations of say three, three sides of a cube. We can kind of appreciate that it's the whole thing. And and I remember a question on that might be like in a view where we are say computational or imagine someone that doesn't have a body, maybe it's, you know, like increasingly like with AI today, like do you think that it's possible for for them to appreciate what things are rather than just I wonder what what do you think to get into maybe the problems of of a, an approach which isn't embodied, you know? In what ways in what ways would someone see the world if if they were embodied? Is it does it make sense to ask a question like that? I mean, I think it definitely makes sense to ask the question. As mm -hmm. for the answer to it, that's right. something that I'm not at all sure about. Right. Um, I mean, I think what I what I do think here is that our way into these questions should start from thinking about our own experiences, our own perceptions, our own thoughts and feelings. Because when we're asking about whether a, a computer or any kind of like disembodied um, entity or like machine could have experiences, could have perceptions, could have thoughts, could have feelings, what we're asking about is whether they could have the kinds of things that we have, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so to answer that question, it seems to me like, well, look, the first thing that we've got to do then is understand like, well, what is it that we've got? What's going on with us mm -hmm. when we have mm -hmm. perceptions and thoughts and feelings? And, you know, like I said, when I was talking a bit earlier on about the sort of history of cognitive science, there's this like really influential um, way of thinking that just says, yeah, look, what's going on with us is these kind of computational or like information processing events, right? That, mm -hmm. That's all that there is to it. Um, but if you're at all like skeptical of that view, if you think that there's something in these sorts of embodied and, and active approaches that I'm interested in, that think that like, hey, look, there might be something about the fact that we're living systems or the fact that we're embodied, like mobile agentive mm. systems that is important. And um, that's not going to seem so clear, right? It's not going to seem so obvious that um, the, the sorts of things that are going on in a computer are even the right candidates to be perceptions or thoughts or feelings. So for me, what I what I feel like I need, and you know, and, and in fact, what I think everybody needs before we can really think through these questions about the kinds of psychological states that you know, um, Chat GPT or um, a kind of fancy AI could or couldn't have, um, is a much better understanding of what's going on like with us and um, in our own cases. And one thing that I think that the the raising of this question in the domain of AI makes particularly clear is that if we want to sort of have a fair go, as it were, uh, uh, answering that question, then it's sort of cheating to take a computational framework for granted, it seems mm -hmm. to me, right? So if you're, if you're just kind of starting off, like thinking about these questions by just assuming that a human and a human mind is just a fancy computational device, then of course, it's going to seem natural to think that our fanciest computers might have the very same kinds mm -hmm. of mental or psychological properties as us. But I think what the, just the very existence of other more anti-computational approaches show is that like, well, those questions, they're not quite settled. They're still up for grabs. So one thing that I think is happening with um, all these questions about the capacities of AIs like coming to the forefront is really making these issues about the potential sort of biological or active or embodied basis of um, experience, like a lot more pressing and timely mm -hmm. for people to be thinking about. Thank you. You're talking about the importance of it now and understanding kind of who we are to understand well, us, but then yeah, in a more pressing way, like understand the kinds of uh, intelligence or or you know in systems that we're creating now. I wonder though, in like that makes me want to talk about hit the history of this, and um, and you're a philosopher, so I was wondering, what what philosophers influenced you or influenced like embodied cognition more generally, such that we're starting to rethink computational versions of of 
cognitive science? Well, there's a there's a long list. Um, so, I mean, my my very favourite is a uh, uh, sort of mid twentieth century French philosopher called Maurice Merleau Ponty. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's uh, um, associated with a kind of philosophy called uh, phenomenology. I can mm-hmm. maybe say a bit more about it later. Yeah. Um, but really, like he's um, a bit like me. His kind of main motivation, like throughout his working life, was to just like understand the place of mind in the in the natural world. Um, and one thing that I find really interesting about Merleau Ponty is that he's doing most of his work in the sort of like 1940s to um, about 1960. He sort of mm-hmm. died like fairly, fairly young in 1960. Um, and so in large part, right, he's working before the advent of cognitive science, like as it emerged as a discipline. Um, but one thing that's like really fascinating about his work is that um, a lot of his reflections about what it is to have a mind and how minds kind of fit into the natural world, um, they're precisely the kinds of like reflections and arguments that people are returning to today as they start to kind of like push back at the kind of computational or like mechanical visions of mind that are um, framing contemporary cognitive science. So one of the things that I like so much about Merleau-Ponty is that um, I think like his his work is just this sort of like treasure trove of like arguments and uh, insights that kind of work towards a way of thinking about minds and their place in the world that just looks really different to the one that we ended up with, you know, with cognitive science as it progressed through the uh, mid to late 20th century and got us to where we are today. So um, mm-hmm. that's this is part of the reason why um, I find a lot of value in thinking about various figures from the, the history of philosophy, because um, mm-hmm. if you go far enough back, um, you know, people have been thinking about what a mind is and what experience is and how they fit into the world for as long as people have been thinking at all. Um, mm-hmm. So one thing that's really interesting about tracing those approaches and those thoughts back is that we find lots of um, forgotten paths or um, forgotten like ways of thinking or um, ways of approaching these these issues that in some cases are like really useful or at least interesting to try to recover and see what the see what those approaches look like today. Mm-hmm. And so Merle Ponte, he's he's my favorite guy for mining for um, interesting ideas that sort of like bear yeah. on the contemporary problems. And and on that note, is it, would you be able to touch on like even um, like he, you talk about he was ahead of his time in in, in many ways, right? Um, what about how far back does it go? You know, um, of maybe even early philosophers. Like, are there other? Would you be able to speak about like the hints of these kinds of like ways of thinking um, earlier on? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think one person who is very interesting to trace these ideas right back to is Aristotle. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, full full disclosure, as a result of the sort of philosophy that I've been trained in, like, basically, like, I, I only know about the sort of history of, like, European philosophy, mm. very, like, dimly aware of um, some, like, other, like, philosophical traditions, and, sure. you know, they should be, like, given their dues, like, really sophisticated and, like, rich attempts to, like, think about some of these very same issues. Mm. But at least as far as the sort of history of kind of like Western slash European philosophy is concerned, um, Aristotle is like the first philosopher we know who like really um, made sort of central to his work, right, this attempt to fit minds into his best understanding of the natural world. Mm -hmm. Um, And one thing that's particularly striking if you look at Aristotle today is that he was precisely um, focused on understanding minds as a kind of like natural sort of like biological phenomenon. Mm-hmm. So if we think about, you know, the the standard attempts to fit minds into the natural world these days, um, those sort of like rough, the rough um, tendencies for people to take something like physics or mathematics or perhaps um, 
you know, mechanical processes, right, as their model for thinking about the kinds of things that minds are. Uh, so the, the idea being that like, hey, look, if we're going to explain what it is for a thing to have a mind or for a mind to emerge in nature, we need to kind of ultimately understand how minds are basically um, arise from events of kind of like mechanical like pushings and pullings and like shovings even mm -hmm. if some of those like have a very compl complicated structure and you know involve like instantiating various computational processes mm -hmm. what's interesting about looking back to aristotle is that um you know he in part because the the sort of like mechanical sciences like weren't weren't advanced as far as they are today in ancient greece but he took his lead from um, the best sort of like biological understandings of his day. So for him, like to have mm -hmm. a mind was just like intimately connected to um, being alive, to being a kind of like living organism. And the interesting thing about looking back to Aristotle for these ideas is that he's a, an instance of like, right, well, how how might you kind of build an entire framework for thinking about minds and the pla and their place in the world? by starting from sort of like biological concepts and biological metaphors rather than from physical and mechanical ones. Um, and yeah, I mean, as, as soon as you kind of like realize that you find this alternative approach to thinking of minds as natural phenomenon in Aristotle, then, you know, because he's such a sort of important like touchstone figure for um, European philosophy, you can use Aristotle as a kind of thread right, to kind mm. of like trace those Aristotelian insights um, right back from, I don't know, 2000 mm -hmm. BC or whenever he was doing his thing, like up to the present day. Mm -hmm. In our current day, you talked about how, say, in a lot of the 20th century, a lot of thinking about these subjects was not in a very embodied way. Um, I did a podcast recently where we talked a lot about Descartes and how potentially a lot of these, it goes back to his dualism, right? And the fact that it's easy to, to, to see us as like a mind looking out into the world. Um, but um, I wonder if you could touch on a bit on why do you think maybe computational models of us as like a subjective like observer of the world, um, why they were so kind of prevalent. Um, if, if it turns out now, actually, there are ways we can make better, more nuanced ways of thinking. Why, why for so long did we think that they were the best approach? Yeah, it's a good question. And I mean, I suppose being candid, one thing to say here is that, you know, in in many, many ways, they just have proven to be the best approach, right? So mm -hmm. um, unlike many sort of colleagues and fellow travelers like I have who are also into em embodied cognition, um, a lot of those people like it's very important to them to be sort of like constantly like ragging and like pouring cold water on um, computational models and computational explanations. I don't think that that's a very sort of like productive way to spend one's time. But also, I think there's something, you know, sort of perverse about it because it's just completely undeniable that, you know, we've mm -hmm. we've achieved so much like knowledge and understanding and insight out of the past um, 70 years or so of computational mm -hmm. approaches to the mind. If you think about how much we knew about, uh, you know, human minds and how they worked in 1950 versus what we know today, um, yeah, it's just an exponential growth in knowledge, like most of which I think has been made possible by this computational turn. And so I think if, you know, these sort of embodied cognition people like me are are really trying to be taken seriously, then we have to acknowledge that, like, look, look we've got to we've got to explain that kind of progress and like explain like all the insights that we've uh, that we've gleaned somehow. And so very roughly, like what I want to say there is that, mm. like, for for me, like computational approaches to the mind, it's it's not that they're false exactly. It's that they're kind of incomplete, right? They're a kind of particular mm -hmm. way of like looking at and studying minds, but they're they're never going to give us the the whole story. Mm -hmm. um, they just as a result of the kinds of explanations and kinds of uh, models that they are. They're always going to abstract away from to leave out certain details that might turn out to be really important for understanding certain things. 
Um, mm, quick, yeah. shout, quick shout out to the work of uh, one of my colleagues, like Masvita Chiramuta, um, who has written a lot of insightful stuff about precisely these issues. But as for the question of like exactly why these computational approaches like became so popular, I mean, one one thing to say here, which uh, I think is definitely a big part of the story, is that we can see computational approaches to the mind as just one one kind of step in a long history of using the most recent forms of technological uh, innovation as our kind of best way of understanding what minds are, right? Mm -hmm. So before you had people saying like, oh, maybe minds are just fancy computers. You had people saying, oh, maybe minds are just fancy forms of telephone switchboards, right? When a mm -hmm. telephone switchboard was the most complicated uh, right. sort of physical mechanical device that we had. Before that, like, oh, well, maybe minds are just complicated kinds of like church organs or like pneumatic or like hydraulic devices. Mm -hmm. Maybe minds are like steam engines. Okay, so like all these all these like metaphors for like thinking about minds and how they might might work, um, they've all kind of you know caught on like over mm -hmm. the years. And now like what we see in in yeah like contemporary cognitive science and contemporary society is people thinking, oh, well, maybe minds are just like these, um, you know, complicated, like large language models, like uh, uh, chat GPT and stuff like that. Because, hey, th those are just like our most complicated um, technical artifacts now. And it's just natural to think like, oh, okay, so, you know, what, how much mileage can we get out of um, explaining minds in terms of the, the properties that they might have in common with these like really complicated objects? So in some ways, like the computational turn in um, in cognitive science was precisely just doing that. Like you know, as uh, as digital computation like got invented in the 20th century, all of a sudden like we had this like new, fantastically powerful, fantastically fertile um, technology, and it's just natural to wonder like, okay, well, well, what does that have? What does all the fancy, cool, new stuff that mm -hmm. these things can do? have to do with all the fancy cool stuff that us as human minds can do. And yeah, as I said, there's just no denying that that, that research program of, of trying to kind of like approach and study minds in, in that way just like was and continues yeah. to be enormously successful. I was um I wasn't necessarily going to touch on it, but you kind of bring up like large language models, and I know you you work on say perception and things, which is not that related. So this is more to language, but I mean, do you do you think about um the fact that maybe it's quite surprising that that we we could sort of have, have so quickly kind of gotten something which is like seemingly very intelligible and coherent out of like what might be quite simple like uh, computational kinds of um algorithms like um and does that like shape your thinking or or are there any any thoughts on that and um given that they are embodied you know um or or to what degrees if they were embodied you know what, how might that change that i wonder if, if, if that's kind of a not really a question but you have any thoughts on that yeah i mean I, I think there's really loads and loads of like really rich questions there mm -hmm. um i mean you know like personally Yes, I, I have been quite surprised just by the the really sort of like exponential progress, like in the last you know like year, probably even less, like mm -hmm. um, you know eight months or so, like of uh, what these, what at least the kind of publicly available large language models can do. Um, I mean, so I, I had this uh, experience where. Um, I was teaching one of our big second year courses uh, at the mm -hmm. University of Edinburgh um, from kind of September to December 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and as a sort of exercise, like for that course, like I, um, I marked this essay that GPT-3 had written about uh, consciousness about whether or not you can explain consciousness in terms of physical or computational processes. And I was doing it to just like give um, the students on the course um, an idea of the kind of like feedback that they could expect, an idea of like how our marking scheme worked. Mm -hmm. um, I was partly doing it because I wanted to give them um, give them an, an illustration of like what quite a bad philosophy essay looked like. Right. And so what, what what was really striking about the um, 
GPT-3 essay was that it kind of, you know, it, it looked like a really sort of like mm. archetypal, sort of like bad philosophy essay. There was, it, uh -huh. it looked like there was kind of like some understanding of like some relevant See. kind of like facts and ideas, but they were sort of strung together in this sort of like haphazard way. It wasn't really kind of forming a coherent train of thought. It was just kind of jumping mm -hmm. from one thing to the other without any obvious like rhyme or reason to it. And then it just sort of stops uh, at the end. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I ended up kind of giving it a sort of, you know, borderline like pass fail mark. Okay. So maybe this would, maybe this would fail. Maybe it wouldn't. I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure, but it's definitely right on that borderline. And then, you know, so I think I, I marked that essay like as an exercise in maybe like November or something mm -hmm. like that. And then in December, <laughs> ChatGPT came out, and yeah, it's it's just. Right orders of magnitude um better like the stuff that it can produce and I, I was just like really surprised by you know just how sudden and conspicuous that transition was for from like years and years and years of our best ai systems just kind of you know being stuck at that level where they're mm -hmm. like, you know just like a little bit clunky something not quite right about you know what they mm -hmm. what they do or the outputs they produce um, to all of a sudden, like, you know, they're by no means um, perfect. I was actually like playing around with um, chat GPT like earlier on today and it was, mm -hmm. it was getting some pretty useless stuff. Um, but yeah, they're just so, right, so right, strikingly right. better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, keep going if you, if you want. Um, uh, well, go, go for it. Well, yeah, I mean, what, what I'd like to be able to kind of give you is some like r really well thought out articulate um, view on mm -hmm. on you know what what kind of minds they might have and like what it what it would take if anything for them to for them to have a mind and but yeah basically like I, I don't have one mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> um, I think like you know what I can say is sort of to just return to something that I'd said earlier which I think what the what systems like you know chat gpt and our, our kind of best and fanciest like ais today um make really pressing is to to just you know put more effort and resources into kind of thinking about these like non-computational approaches to mind even if like the end result of that thinking is going to be like oh actually you know they're they're rubbish we should we should have just been going with the computational approaches all along mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that like to answer these questions about like well what what kinds of minds could these large language models have um, if any we need to be able to um, we need to work out what we think about these questions about you know life and embodiment and activity and the way that those might shape the mind mm -hmm. um, those yeah we're not going to be able to put these questions about things like large language models and their minds to bed like until we've got a better grip on um yeah just like just what we think the best models for thinking about minds are yeah yeah okay that's really helpful thank you um and and in touching a bit there on like education and you talked about for example like um sort of um, experiences like teaching your course and, and related to sort of ai i wanted to ask a bit about like you, you wrote a paper about about how embodied cognition can kind of maybe help uh, appreciate ways in which we could like, improve education on specifically on sort of uh, online education and, and these virtual experiences. So maybe we could talk a bit first about in, in what ways is this even relevant, a question to ask about, about like the way we teach, the way education works, to think about the way we learn in an embodied way. Yeah, I mean, one interesting thing about that paper is that it was written, I don't know, maybe about sort of 2017 or 2018, mm -hmm. you know, so like quite a long time ago now and, and certainly, you know, pre-pandemic, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, basically the majority of people like who are either kind of participating yeah the majority of people who are participating in, in, in education in some way have like vastly more experience of online kind of disembodied uh, education right. than than they did like when I was writing that paper so I think mm -hmm. you know 
I, I haven't looked at it recently, but I'll bet that there's some stuff in there that, you know, w would make me cringe already. Sure. <laughs> um, so, I mean, and another thing about that, that paper I wrote is that it's sort of partly written in response to um, this sort of very important, influential figure in the sort of history of embodied cognition movements called Hubert Dreyfus, um, who wrote some kind of uh, bad-tempered, uh, old mannish kind of stuff about online education right. in the sort of early 21st century, basically saying like, oh, it's, it's never going to work. You know, education, it needs to be this kind of like embodied encounter between the, the student and the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so reasons why he said that included just, well, like if you're not like in a in a room, like at the actual kind of physical, like shared space as other people, um, then it's much harder to kind of like pick up on things like the mood in the in the mm -hmm. classroom, right? So part of uh, part of what's involved in you know a sort of good educational experience is um, perhaps. I mean, in, in philosophy, at least, this kind of sense of a sort of shared intellectual endeavor of like trying, you know, we're all in this room together, like trying to kind of get to grips with like what the hell is going on with whatever mm -hmm. issue that we're trying to think about. And so the sort of like emotional, like ebb and flow of that process can uh, be like a really important like aspect of um of the sort of like educational experience, right? Mm -hmm. The kind of like shared sort of like confusion and frustration, like as we mm -hmm. try to kind of like formulate the problem and then, you know, the sort of little bits of like euphoria is like, it seems mm -hmm. like we're, we're getting somewhere. Um, and then yeah. you know, the, the, <laughs> the subsequent frustration at realizing like, oh no, actually there's, there's a bit more work to do. And so part of um, this guy Dreyfus's thought, thought is that, look, these kinds of um, experiences of like shared emotion and like emotional contagion between sort of teachers and students, they're like a really fundamental part of like a lot of good education. And they're just much, much harder to uh, foster. I mean, in fact, he, he thought uh, they, they were impossible to kind of foster mm -hmm. in online environments. Um, and so the main sort of point that I was trying to make in the paper that I wrote is that I, I kind of think that the lesson that we should be drawing from the sorts of work on embodied cognition that I'm interested in is is precisely that no like those sorts of um, those sorts of experiences experiences of like emotional engagement or contagion they're precisely not impossible right in a mm -hmm. online environment because one of the things that we know from thinking about the way in which our kind of like bodily skills and habits like shape the kinds of experiences that we have is that we're kind of remarkably sort of like flexible and like plastic right mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. um as experiencers so you know one really common example that people often return to in this embodied cognition literature is the the example of um learning how to like climb a rock face um if you've kind of never climbed before and you go and stand at the bottom of um, a, a cliff that, you know, you're, it's your job to climb, um, then, you know, the first time you do it, it just looks like this like blank, inscrutable, like wall of rock. Obviously not, mm -hmm. not exactly blank. It's got loads of like knobbly bits and like st bits sticking out. But I mean, you know, they, mm -hmm. they don't really mean anything to you. Um, but then as you kind of like acquire like new skills, like as you like learn how to do new things with your your body, um, you know, climbing up cliff faces with it and like the different kinds of like holds and like poses and like, you know, tricks that you can that you can use to kind of get yourself up there. Um, the way that you experience the cliff face changes right mm -hmm. and it's not just that when you're standing at the bottom you you think new things about the cliff face um it's not that you have a, the kind of same visual experience but you know you can do different things with that experience it seems that like no it's actually your experience itself changes right things look different to you now that you've learned how to do different things with your body mm -hmm. so the, the kinds of like embodied cognition approaches that I'm interested in and that in fact this guy Dreyfus like helped to popularize 
um, they make a lot out of that fact, right? That the kinds of um, bodily skills that we have, they're kind of constantly evolving. They're they're mm. plastic. We can kind of like reshape them, and that those skills will in turn kind of reshape the kinds of experiences that we have. And so, part mm. of my thought in this um, paper about online education is just that, like, well, hey, look, um, as we get more fluent in using and interacting with any technology, including sort of like online distant learning, distance learning technology, the kinds of experiences that that technology or that those forms of interaction are going to be able to support is going to change. So whilst mm. I think it's it was probably perfectly true for this guy, Hubert Dreyfus, that if, if he was teaching online or if he was like part of an online class, like he just would have found it this kind of disorienting and like alienating and confusing experience that he was like getting nothing out of. I don't think that that would necessarily kind of stay the case, right? If he kind mm. of continued to kind of like engage with that that technology, then he would be able to kind of like replicate some of the sorts of um, experiences and sort of emotional encounters and stuff like that, that he thought was so valuable about education. Oh. And so right. in, in the end, okay. right, part of the conclusion, insofar as I had a positive conclusion I wanted to motivate in that work was that like, look, if, if we're interested in um, thinking about online education, then what we need to start by doing is like really think hard about what sorts of um, experiences and interactions and processes we think are most valuable in the kind of education we concern, we're concerned with. And then think really hard about how we can kind of foster or shape those sorts of experiences using the technology that we have available to us. I see. Like, um, I don't want to put, put too much onto this because you've had a really nice sort of um, summary and, and then insight into like what you were doing with that paper. But um, I wonder if, if this would be correct to express your viewers like, um, given we're embodied agents, actually like that embodied setting doesn't really put uh, uh, you know, preclude our involvement with technologies because we kind of have an embodied use and, and interaction with them. Um, um, I think um, like like Andy Clark, I think he was at Edinburgh, maybe he still is, and he has like a lot of work on like the way we sort of interact with technologies. So so is it? Is you maybe share some of that sentiment that actually like it's sort of as technologies evolve, as we evolve like to use them, that that in fact like. It can support. I wonder if you think as well, like maybe new kinds of improved ways of learning could actually be facilitated, like with online things, um, technologies, like maybe even better than than in person ever could be. Yeah, I mean, on the on the Andy Clark thing, mm -hmm. yeah, he's a, a beloved former colleague of mine, actually former super supervisor of mine. All he, right. he supervised my um, PhD dissertation. Um, now at the University of Sussex. Um, but yeah, he you're exactly right that he um, is a really important figure in this sort of like embodied cognition movement, but he's very sort of like pro-tech, right? Mm -hmm. So it's part of Andy's view that, yeah, we're, uh, as, as the title of one of his books put it, we're natural born cyborgs, right? It's just part of what it is to be human that um, we've always been kind of prone to using technology to kind of deal with the problems that the world throws up, whether that's, you know, axes and stone tools mm -hmm. or whether it's uh, iPhones and large language models. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I'm kind of completely on board with um, that thought that, you know, an understanding of the way that human minds and human subjectivity is shaped by our interactions with the world is always going to include the kinds of uh, technologies and tools that we use to mediate that interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and then the uh, yeah the I, second part I, I of the question. A final bit about about you know maybe, maybe in that sense in given that perspective maybe like you could actually have an optimistic view that you know in fact maybe you could even develop experiences that are better than than we have now in person. I don't know if you if there's anything to say on that. Um, you might have yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to rule out the possibility of an yeah. optimistic view. I mean, I suppose I think that the the sort of duty here is to be 
open-minded, right? Because the, the point about, you know, it, it's just a fact, right? That um, different technologies and different ways of using and interacting with technologies can open up new sorts of experiences that just weren't accessible to us before. Um, you know, so the mm -hmm. kinds of experiences that the shape of sort of experience like today for people who are sort of like constantly uh, constantly networked, constantly online, that's just a kind of facet of experience that maybe it kind of had some ancestors or like echoes to somebody who was alive, say, in the 17th century. But it's kind of it still counts as something that's really qualitatively different. Yeah. The question of like whether they're kind of forms of experience or forms of education to be specific that are that are going to be better well i think like that's not something that it's possible to give a confident answer sure. on in advance right because the the whole point is that we can't know or we can't like imagine from our current perspective um what those forms of experience uh, are going to be like so I think that the responsible thing to do is to just like be open-minded, try it and see, right? And then, um, yeah, try to, mm -hmm. I think this is part of what I think is like important about um, something I said earlier, which is that I think our sort of thinking in this area needs to be guided by some attempts to like work out what we think the valuable aims and outcomes and experiences involved in education are. Mm -hmm. Because without having something like that kind of benchmark, we just don't have any kind of nice stable grounds to start to assess whether we think that some change in the way that we experience education or engage in it, engage in education is a change for the better or a change for the worse. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Thank you. I um and on, on on that note, there was one final paper that like uh to like talk about specifics of your work that I wanted to ask about because just grappling with it yesterday. And uh, loads of it was really compelling, um, but as well sometimes a bit confusing. So um, not in a bad way, um, in like a way that's like it's it's uh, an, in an interesting one, which was on uh, the placebo placebo effect, and the way in which uh, embodied cognition and thinking ourselves uh, as ourselves more as uh, agents, sort of in the world, that it can help sort of appreciate the sort of confounded nature that the placebo effect has on science, uh, difficulties in kind of understanding it. So if you don't know if you want to maybe explain a bit about what you did there and then we could get into that. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, so first of all, shout out to uh, Giulio Ongaro, who was the um, who was the kind of main author in that paper. Um, and that, that paper actually kind of grew out of a master's dissertation that he wrote whilst he was mm -hmm. at the University of Edinburgh uh, that, you know, I, I liked so much that, was, that I thought like, hey, Mm -hmm. you know you, you should try to publish this maybe we could kind of make it into a paper together and so we we eventually mm -hmm. did one of the really interesting things about um julio and like julio's work is that he's uh from an anthropology background um and so he was coming to these issues from thinking about the ways in which um different cultures uh experienced or underwent like placebo effects and the, sort of some of the interesting things to do with the cultural variability that we find in placebo effects um, and in fact he kind of went off and did loads of cool uh, anthropological work you know right. looking at various kinds of like uh, tribal and like shamanic uh, medicine so okay. his, his kind of cool work continues mm -hmm. um, but the sort of main idea of that paper is that um, Placebo effects are uh, effects that kind of look quite mysterious if we think of minds as things that are, you know, quite separate or shut away from the body and from the world. Um, so very roughly, right, if kind of if minds are, are just these kind of like in, internal like theatres where various kind of thoughts and experiences pop up that, you know, sure they have this like cause relationship to our body and to the world like the, the sort of signals that the world pipes in they make things happen in our minds and stuff that happens in our minds it kind of like makes our bodies like move around and stuff um, mm. if that's the picture of the the mind that we're working with then loads of placebo effects perhaps all placebo effects like seem really puzzling so you know, one of the examples of a sort of startling placebo effect that we used in that 
paper was, was uh, placebo surgeries, where mm -hmm. um, you get like a bunch of patients who have um, chronic arthritis, like in their knees, like you know, some of whom have just been like unable to walk for years and years, or at least not being able to walk with like excruciating pain. You give them all uh, arthroscopic knee surgery, right, where you sort of put them to sleep and you um, uh, you kind of like open up their knees and you kind of like scrape and like rinse out the, the knee joint. Um, mm. And uh, unbeknownst to them, well, I, I, actually, I guess for, for ethical reasons, right, they, they had to tell them, right, oh, you, you might be getting this like placebo surgery mm. or you might be getting the real one. We're not going to tell you which is which. Um, and so some of these uh, some of these patients, like instead of giving them the actual arthroscopic surgery, they just like put them to sleep. They kind of made two incisions um, in their knee. Then they didn't do anything else. They just kind of stitched the incisions back up and woke them up and said, OK, you know, your, your surgery is over. Off you go. Mm -hmm. um, and they kind of found that the people with the uh, fake surgery had slightly better outcomes than the people with the, the real surgery. Um, and it wasn't just that, you know, the, the surgeries, like, they didn't work, they didn't do much. Mm -hmm. right? the, 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 the overall outcomes were like really successful. You had like lots of these patients um, reporting like just being able to walk like pain free, mm -hmm. walk fluently in ways that they hadn't been able to do for, for years and years. And so that's like really mysterious. Um, mm -hmm. if for the people who have undergone the placebo surgery where you haven't made any sort of like real mechanical changes to the nuts and bolts of what's going on in their knee, all mm -hmm. that you've done is kind of, you know, changed their mind a little bit, right? You've kind of given them this like false belief or like false understanding that they've just undergone this surgery. Mm -hmm. um, so the kind of motivating idea of like this placebo paper is that, um, Placebo effects are, are kind of like really puzzling for these views of the views of the mind that just see them as kind of somehow like shut off from the rest of the world and the rest of the body. But if you have one of these kind of like embodied, engaged, like inactive approaches um, to the mind where um, yeah, the, the mind and body and society are all kind of like intermingled and like mashed up together, then that gives you a framework for thinking about um, the relationship between the mind and the body and the sort of culturally meaningful treatments and practices that these people are engaging with um, that makes placebo effects start to look like the sort of thing that we would expect and find perfectly natural rather than the sort of thing that you know seems irresolvably mysterious. Mm -hmm. There was um, something to to help try and unpack that to, to for me and, and others to understand it is you talk about how so expectation and beliefs are important, but also in that paper you sort of make clear that it's not a kind of necessarily an an obviously conscious belief or just a conscious belief. Um, it's in some ways, um, but neither is it just like to an, an, un an unconscious like expectation. There's would you like to unpack unpack like precisely kind of the mechanisms by, by, by which um, this, this kind of works, the way in which as we go into the experience, we have some expectations, but as well, they, they did change us. Um, yeah. Yeah. That I makes mean, sense? It does make sense. Yeah. So I guess like here, I think it's useful to just think about sort of like bodily skills in general and what it's mm -hmm. like to sort of like learn a new one. So I don't know, you should, you or your listeners should pick your favorite, like, embodied skill that you recently learned. Sure. Um, for me, like, it's maybe, you know, I'm quite old, so I don't learn very many new embodied skills anymore. But I, I did learn how to drive, like, quite recently, like, I learned quite okay. late. And that was, like, really striking for me, uh, because, well, one thing is it, it made me realize, like, oh, I've just not learned any new skills for years mm -hmm. and years. But it was also like really interesting kind of, you know, reflecting on the experience of, of what, what that was like. And so one thing that, you know, learning how to drive or learning any kind of complex new embodied skill involves is, you know, being really rubbish at it at first mm -hmm. and having to kind of proceed by having all these like rules and principles that you're like consciously applying and like memorizing like, OK, so I need to kind of put the clutch in a little bit now and mm -hmm. I need to like. I'm going around a roundabout, so I need to like look in that mirror, then look in that mirror, but also like you know, indicate in between. 
Um, and what happens is like as you as you learn, as you just kind of practice, you find that you, you don't have to think that stuff anymore. It just sort of happens, right? Mm. And so it's this change from sort of having to sort of like consciously and explicitly keep on like saying and thinking all this stuff to yourself all the time to this stuff just kind of sort of like soaking into your body, right? Just becoming this kind of like automatic, like embodied habit that you have for dealing with the world. And so, you know, when I kind of say that like, hey, look, these kinds of embodied responses to placebo effects, that it's not like they're kind of straightforward beliefs, but it's also not like they're kind of like completely unconscious reactions. Mm -hmm. I guess like it's that sort of experience of like embodied skill that I've got in mind, right? So just mm -hmm. as the sort of just as the sort of like driver who's like learned what they're doing, they don't have to kind of consciously, you know, repeat like rules and principles about driving to themselves anymore. But that's not because they don't have any experience of like what they're supposed to be doing. It's just that that experience is kind of like sunk into their embodied habits for for driving properly. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the person who um, is able to walk again because they've had like placebo knee surgery, it's not like they have this kind of like explicit belief that like I have had surgery, so now I can walk again. It kind of mm -hmm. explains explains what they're doing. And in fact, like part of what I think is good about the sort of embodied or inactive approach, but bad about the the alternative approaches, is that in these kind of more disembodied approaches, it looks like you're kind of forced. That's why they look mysterious, right? Plus mm -hmm. evil effects. Because, you know, all that they, all that it seems that they're able to say is like, oh, well, they, you know, somebody must have like a belief or maybe an unconscious belief about mm -hmm. the efficacy of these um, healing practices that's somehow causing this thing to happen. Um, whereas what we're trying to argue in that paper is that in a more embodied or an active approach, um, what you've got is this kind of like embodied habit about um, what you expect the cultural uh, mm -hmm. cultural and healing practices of your community to, to do for you, right? I see. And so it's that expectation, right? That kind of embodied expectation about what the um, cultural and experiential significance of something like a surgery or an injection or taking a pill is going to do. Um, that leads to those embodied effects rather than something like a conscious belief. Mm -hmm. What I'll be right in saying is it like to to frame that in my own mind, is it something like you're you're the kind of person that has gone to hospitals before, you're the kind of person that like lives in a society that has kind of beliefs and 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 just actually has benefited from surgery. So you can't you can't sort of um extricate those like conscious from unconscious beliefs like it's you're in the in a world surrounded by like the fact that surgeries do work so it's it's like in a way like of course if you kind of go into it um many levels of like your experience it's gonna feel and be like like you know that that you that you you're supposed to improve um okay um, yeah exactly yeah, yeah, so sure. you know, it, it kind of works for us but you know if, if you took somebody who's just never, you know, they kind of grew up in a culture where they just don't have like surgical procedures mm -hmm. and say like, oh, don't worry, we're going to fix you. We're just going to, um, you know, take you and give you these drugs that make you unconscious. And then we're going to mm -hmm. like slice you up and like inject you with things and then you'll be fine. That is not going to be experienced as kind of like healing right by them, you know, even though like, you know, of course, like that, the, whatever surgery you perform, it might have kind of like, beneficial like uh, physiological effects on them but it's not going to have any nice kind of um nice kind of happy like placebo effects like it would uh, on me right with my kind of particular uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. culturally mediated like expectations about what surgeries are and how they're going to help me right um i won't talk about any much about your your work now i'm just as we near the near the end of this I was thinking maybe like asking a question about how you come up with say ideas for papers and you talked about for example like reading Merleau-Ponty or you know like these philosophers have like great ideas and rekindling them sometimes um, but I wonder is there like a set process for making a new paper um, are there ways you do it um, uh, do you have like favorite papers as well or like ones you're most proud of yeah 
Um, yeah, I mean, how, how to come up with ideas for papers. Well, I mean, like I said, that, you know, the the thing that really sort of motivates me like in philosophy are, are these what I think are like kind of deep puzzles about the the place of mind in the natural world. Um, and I'm sort of, you know, my my sort of uh, life as a philosopher is all about kind of groping towards some kind of nice coherent framework towards thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so really, like, whenever I'm writing something, that's the, that's ultimately like what I'm trying to do, right? I'm writing it because it's somehow, I think it somehow fits into or like helps me with that overarching project, right, of coming up with a, a framework for understanding how minds fit into the world. I see. Um, but I mean, more specifically, I, th I think like for a lot of, for a lot of philosophers and, and for a lot of the stuff that I write, a lot of it is sort of like re partly reactively motivated, right? It's motivated mm -hmm. by reading, reading stuff that other people have done and then either being kind of, well, being inspired by it in some way, like whether for better or worse, right? And so in the, in the good case, that's like, oh, wow, what you've, you know, this, this thing that you've written is like really amazing and insightful. But there's also this other kind of consequence of it or application of this idea that, you know, wasn't in there, but that I think is like really good and fruitful. Um, or in the negative case, it's like, well, you know, there's something right about this thing that you've written, but, you know, I, I think that it, it gets these things wrong. So it would be much better if you did it this way instead. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like a lot of the stuff that I write is sort of like motivated by engaging with other people's work and, you know, thinking, thinking that I can do something to kind of like improve it or sort of like push the projects push the project that they're engaged on forward in some way. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And um, maybe a final question would be, do you have advice for, say, for example, university students in who, who want to explore say, cognitive science, philosophy, or more, uh, more generally, like how to have a successful career, how to get interested in, in these topics or whatever they're interested in? Do you have advice for kind of younger people? Mm. Yeah, good question. Let me think of something to say that isn't uh, stupid. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, if you wanted, you could speak like practically, like how did you like decide to do, say, do a PhD or like get into academia? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think that I'm a I'm a sort of poor model in some ways, although I do know a lot of colleagues who are like me in that I, I sort of fell into it um, mm -hmm. in the sense that, um, you know, I kind of finished my undergraduate degree and, um, I you know, I got like really into sort of studying philosophy like over the course of that. But I ended up like doing a master's like just because you know, it wasn't because I wanted a career as a philosopher. It was because I was like really enthused by the prospect of like doing doing more philosophy, and mm -hmm. you know, I didn't I didn't have any other kind of better ideas about like right. career paths. I was just like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll just do this again for a year, and then during my year of doing my master's degree there was this like kind of period in the middle where like oh everybody on my course is applying for PhD programs mm -hmm. um, and they were all asking me like oh you know what what are you doing next year what PhD program programs are you applying for and uh, mm -hmm. initially I was like well none like I hadn't I hadn't thought right. about that at all but then you know I just thought like well I suppose you know I, I don't have any other ideas about what I'm going to do next year and right. I, I am still enjoying doing this like yeah maybe I should give it a go and mm -hmm. so you know I was, I was fortunate enough to um yeah like get get funding to come and do a PhD in Edinburgh so again like I, I wasn't I didn't really have this like conscious idea of like a sort of career progression in mind I was just sort of like bumbling along like following the following mm -hmm. the path that like interested me and so, which to an extent you know that's just what I've what I've continued to do um I mean mm -hmm. I su but, so I suppose like a piece of advice that I do have is that I think the the wise thing to do is to sort of strike a balance between what I did and what a more sort of mature 
career oriented person like would have done right so in a sense like what what I did and you know obviously it's kind of worked out very well for me like I'm kind of doing a job that I love in a in a city that I love but I mean that's a lot of like luck and happenstance mm -hmm. right has gone into that outcome and I so I wouldn't advise like anybody to just adopt the kind of like ah, oh, just like bumble along and mm. hope that it all works out fine approach that, that I endorse. It's just basically like it's, it's a lot of years of your life that you're mm -hmm. kind of like plowing into studying a postgraduate level that you know, is, is kind of you got to kind of think about whether that's a good investment um, mm -hmm. if the if the kind of like chances of you kind of doing that as a doing that as a career are are you know they're fairly slim like as they are for like most academic disciplines um mm. so you know I, I think for anybody like who's thinking about you know f further education to like whatever extent like i i think it's, it is important to um not just bumble along right to kind of like mm. have the long view in mind and if you do kind of take those further steps of like say like studying towards a, a phd just try to be like realistic um, about mm. things like the kind of state of the state of the job market and try to like have that in mind from an early stage, right? So mm -hmm. the people who I've worked with, right, who have who have kind of like done the best in their in their sort of like young careers as as philosophers are, are people like who've always been like quite conscious about like, look here, you know, here are the things that I can do to kind of like help my prospects when I get out of this this degree and they've they've been mm -hmm. quite serious and engaged from the start about um, doing what they need to do to kind of develop themselves as right, right, uh, right. as a philosopher or like whatever other wh whatever other discipline so I think it's important to sort of be much more mature and forward-looking than I was right if you're going to be sensible about it but the counterbalance to that is that I also think it's really important to um, make sure that you have like some of what what I had, which was just that like I was only doing these things because that was what I was like really motivated and like and passionate about doing. Mm -hmm. And you know it, it's rare, but I have come across like some people like who, um, you know, when I said like why why did I do a PhD in philosophy? It's like well because because I sort of loved it and was mad for it and didn't have any better ideas about uh, what else I should be doing. I know some people like who um, are have mainly kind of done a PhD in philosophy just for the latter reason, right? Because they they didn't really have any other ideas, but they, mm -hmm. they didn't particularly love it. They weren't particularly mad for it. Like it it was fine, you know. I see. You don't mind, you know, it's a kind of perfectly pleasant way to like while away the time. And I don't know any of those people for for whom kind of things have have panned out really well right so i think right. if you're if you're going to do it if like if you think that you might want to kind of pursue some kind of academic career you got to make you know don't do it because you think that it's like a really kind of secure and fruitful career path like do it because you're absolutely mad for it and it's it's what mm -hmm. makes you really happy awesome thank you do you have any anything else you want to say or um if like people want to like find your papers or, or anything i mean i can link link to some of the papers i mentioned but anything i'm going to say to sort of close this out well if anybody wants to i don't know like read any of my papers or or find me then you know google me email me always happy to chat to mm -hmm. people who are interested in thinking about mind as a natural and active and engaged phenomenon and uh, yeah, read read more Merleau Ponty. He's great. Mm -hmm, yeah, <laughs> I need to. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, great to talk to you. Thanks, guys. I'll stop the recording now. Um...